Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to this Thursday broadcast of our Karis Daily Live Bible Study. My name is Mike Pickett, and I'm so blessed to be here with you um, just going through the study. Uh, again, just to remind you, this is a live Bible study, so the person who's going to be teaching you today is, is going to be live, and so we encourage you to uh, participate. This is not just about us teaching the Word, but it's about you, you receiving it. It's about you asking questions. So whatever forum that you're watching this live Bible study on, please go down to the question section, enter your question and, and uh, send it to us. And we're going to leave about 10 to 15 minutes at the end of this live Bible study so we can answer as many questions as possible. And again, I just want to remind you, if you can keep your questions relevant to the topic, you're much more likely to have your questions answered. Uh, I'll tell you guys, again, this is going to be a, an amazing time. And we invite you as, as you're going through this, as you're asking questions, if, uh, if you have any prayer requests, any prayer needs, please reach out to us. Please contact us. Our, our phone number is 719 719- 635-1111. We'd love to hear from you. We'd love to stand and believe God w uh, with you. We know that whatever situation or circumstances is coming against you right now, we know that the Word of God has the answer. So we encourage you, please reach out to us and, and allow us to partner with you in prayer. Also, when, you're, when you do call in, um, what, what our prayer ministers will be able to do is refer you back to our website, which is awmi.net. And while you're there, I'll tell you, there's over 200,000 hours of free teachings. That's right, 200,000 hours. So whatever the circumstance might be, there's resources there for you. I'll tell you, you're going to be blessed. It's incredible teaching right to the heart of the matter. And it's all based upon the Word of God. And it's going to, it, the Word will set you free. So we encourage you, go there, go to awmi.net. Whether you give us a call or not, there's plenty of resources for you to, to research and to, to discover all the things that God declares over your life in His precious promises. Also, while you're there, we encourage you, since this is a partner or, or viewer-supported broadcast, we do encourage you to partner up with this ministry. There's th this word is reaching out all over the world through these through these live casts. We're, we're reaching to nations that people might actually not be able to go, especially during these crazy times where there's restrictions on, and so many different borders. Praise God, the internet knows no restrictions. So we encourage you to partner with this ministry. As the word goes out, as lives are being tra uh, transformed, as, as they're being changed, you can have a part with that. So if you go to AWMI. Um, dot net backslash give, you, you, they're going to have specific instructions on how you can partner with this ministry. Well, again, we just want to say thank you so much for tuning in with us. We have a, an amazing time in the Word in store for you. Um, we have a very special guest who's going to be here with us. Um, she's part of our World Outreach Department of this ministry. And for those of you who might not know what World Outreach is, so basically, um, we here in Woodland Park we have Andrew Womack Ministries and Karis Bible College and a couple other parts of the ministry as well. This is our home base. But outside of Woodland Park, we have so many different locations all over the world. We're in 20 different nations, not including the United States. We have 16 international AWM offices, as well as we, I believe we're, we're around 52 Karis Bible College locations. So the person who's going to be sharing us, with us today, her name is Deanne Gissel. She is, uh, she's a blessing. I know that uh, for those of you who tune in quite often, you've heard her before, and I'm sure you've been blessed. But she f formally directed our office in uh, Phoenix, Arizona, and uh, she's, uh, she, she has since taken over the position, and I want to make sure I, I get this, this right. She's a stateside region number two director. We have three stateside directors who oversee all the different locations. And there 20, there's 24 locations here in the United States. Well, she's one of them, and she oversees seven of those locations, and she's such a blessing. And so she's, uh, she's full of wisdom. She's full of the Word, and I know that she, she's going to bless you today. So, Deanne, I just want to say, first of all, welcome here, and we're so excited to hear from you. Thank you. Um, the last two times that I was here teaching, I taught on uh, the Old Testament. So I'm going to switch it up a little bit. All right. And see if we can jump into the New Testament. That sounds great. So if everybody has their Bibles, um, I'm going to be reading out of chapter 10 in Luke, Luke chapter 10. And um, so let's jump into it. The first verse on chapter 10, Luke 10, it says, After these things, the Lord appointed other 70 also and sent them two and two before his face into every city and place whither he himself would come. So basically what's happening here is Jesus is going to be going into these different places, but he's sending these 70 before him. 
And what's really interesting is the word appointed in this is the same word that they use when they appointed Matthias after Judas fell. Then Matthias was the one that was appointed. So this is really a setup for discipleship. And what Jesus wants to do is send these people ahead of him so that they can be healing and they can be proclaiming that Jesus is coming. And um, so the very second verse here, it says, therefore said he unto them, the harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he would send forth laborers into the harvest. This is a scripture that I reference a lot because there's oftentimes where we have family members or friends that we're really believing for. And um, we actually have a family member in, in my family right now that has distanced themselves from us. And so we're not able to speak into their lives because they've decided not to um, communicate with us. And so what I've been praying for this person is that laborers would be sent across her path. So um, that's a really good thing that when you think about it, somebody that Mike might not be able to reach might be somebody that I can reach. And so as he's praying for laborers to come across the paths of, of people that he's believing for, then maybe that could be a part that I could play or vice versa. So that, that verse is, is something that, that I reference a lot when I'm thinking about people that I might not be able to reach, that we would be able to send laborers out to them. So if you go on to verse three, it says, go your ways, behold, I send you forth as lambs among wolves. So that sounds a little scary, but, <laughs> um, you know, this is also referenced in Matthew 10, 16, Matthew 10, 16 says, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves, be ye therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. So when you think about serpents, Serpents, they never unnecessarily expose themselves, right? And then doves never um, provoke on purpose. So um, that's something that kind of helps us to see what he means by that. And um, so when I was thinking about this verse, I was on a mission trip in the Philippines. And so sometimes you can be set into a situation where it might not be a necessarily safe situation to be in, but because of the wisdom of God, I know that I'm to be wise as a serpent and to be as um, harmless as a dove. So that means I am going to listen to the Holy Spirit and rely on him to tell me, you know, how to, how to go about that. Um, so then when you go to verse four, it says, carry neither purse nor script nor shoes and salute no man, by the way. Now the word tells us that we're to be courteous to other people. Of course, we want to be kind to other people, but what, what was happening back in that time is sometimes when they were greeting somebody, it would take forever. They would have to greet all the family members. And sometimes they would have to do it, you know, some up to 10 times. And so when you, when you read this verse, verse four, it's saying, carry no, neither purse nor script nor shoes and salute no man by the way. Basically, that's what, it, what it's telling me is this is an urgent, um, this is urgent that you're going out before Jesus, that, that you don't have time to waste to, to um, do all these ceremonies. So then... When it goes down to verse six, it says, and if the son of peace be there, your peace shall rest upon it. And if not, it shall turn to you again. So basically they're saying if they're, if you're received with peace, um, now, whether it was good or bad, um, back in that time, they would call you the son of it. So that's where they're saying, if you were a son of peace, then you can go into this house. And in verse eight, it says, and into whatever city you enter, and they receive you, eat, eat such things as set before you. Um, you know, I think that this is probably where us moms got that thing where we go to our friend's house when we were little and they would say, okay, whatever they give you, make sure that you just graciously eat whatever they give you. Now, my youngest son, he was um, going over to his friend's house and we had that same conversation. Okay, whatever they offer you to eat, you know, make sure that you just receive that graciously. And so the next day, the mom told me, you know, your son said, I don't like this, but I'm going to eat it anyway. 
So I think he kind of missed the point <laughs> of that whole thing. <laughs> but this is also something to, to um, that comes into play when you go on mission trips. So when I was in the Philippines or any of my other mission trips, whatever was set before me, then I made sure that that's something that I would eat and not complain about and graciously receive it. So, um, so God is, or Jesus is setting these people up and he's telling them, this is how you minister. And this is how you go before me so that when I come, they have an idea of who I am. Mm -hmm. So then if you go to verse 10, it says, but into who, whosoever city you enter and they receive you not go your way out into the streets of the same and say, even the very dust of the city, which cleave on us, we do wipe up, wipe off against you, notwithstanding, be sure of this, what the kingdom of God is come nigh unto you. So if they don't receive you, then basically he's saying, just shake off the dust and move on. And this reminds me of what Andrew talks about. He had a dream one time where he was running a race and he was running around the track and people were saying things to him or taunting him or, or coming against him. And he was going up into the stands and fighting with them. And so what God is saying is don't waste your time that reject my word. Because again, this message is urgent. So we want to make sure that we're not wasting our time with that. Not that they're not important people, but what we want to do is make sure that we can get to the people that are open to receive what we have to say. So that's kind of an overview at the very beginning of, of Jesus sending out the 70. Now, some translations say 70, some say 72. I would love to know what other people think about the 70 number because I always study all of these things. Like there's a reason why there were 70. And, you know, the only things that I saw through commentary was when Jethro was talking to Moses and said, hey, you need to have more people helping you. Then there was 70 appointed. Uh, another situation was when uh, Joseph's family came to him. When they left, there were 70 people that created Israel. Mm -hmm. So um, I don't know if that's the reason why, but I think the main thing is Jesus is building his team. Amen. And so that's something for us to know as well. And, and what a great picture of that, because that's exactly what happens at Karis. You know, Karis Bible College builds a team so that we can go out and proclaim the good news and do what Jesus has asked us to do, heal the sick, right? So this is the part that I really like a lot. This is on verse 17. So he sent the 70 out and now they've come back. And it says, and the 70 returned again with joy saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. So they're really excited. You know, I kind of think about like, they just won the game. Like, this is so exciting. We went out and this actually worked. And, you know, that is exciting. When you see somebody get healed, you're like, wow, that's so amazing. Mm -hmm. So then if you skip down to verse 19, it says, behold, this is Jesus talking. So he says to them, behold, I give them to you the power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Notwithstanding, so verse 20, notwithstanding in this rejoice not that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. So they're really excited because they've seen this power work. And this reminds me in Acts where they had the seven sons of Sceva. So the seven sons of Sceva, they're, you know, um, they're religious leaders. And so they're hearing about all these things that Jesus is able to do, that Jesus, you know, in the name of Jesus, we're able to cast out demons. So remember when we were talking about wise as serpents and gentle as doves. So they're seeking out it because they want to, to show the power of it, right? It's not relational. So they, you know, find a demon possessed, de demon possessed person. And they basically say in the name of Jesus, get out of this person. And this is what the demon says, Jesus, I know, Paul, I know, but who are you? So there's no relationship. It's really about us wielding power. 
And so what happens is the demon that's in this person actually jumps on these seven people and they run out naked and wounded. So what Jesus is saying is the reason why you have this power is because it's been placed on you because of the relationship that you have, Amen. that this is about Jesus. And this is not about um, putting on a show necessarily. Right. So um, then when you skip down to um, verse 21 and 22, I counted five times. Jesus is basically rejoicing in the spirit. And so this is what he's doing. He's rejoicing in the relationship that he has with God. So five times. Jesus is saying, Father. And then there's two times where he references, it, references himself as the Son. So that's relational. And so this is what Jesus is, is imparting to these 70. Your main thing is that you are a child of God. Amen. And that's, and the power is secondary to that. Amen. So I thought that, that was um, something that really jumped out to me. So now the, the next part is, is pretty much, um, I think even people that aren't believers would know about the Good Samaritan. So this is the part that we're coming to. So in chapter 20, or excuse me, it's, we're still in chapter 10. In verse 25, it says, and behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him. Now remember, it says, and he tempted him. So he's not there because he's like, Jesus, we just really want to know. He wants to trip Jesus up, basically. So it says, and behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inter in inherit eternal life? Now, when, when, the, when they use the term lawyer here, this means that he's a teacher of the law. So he knows the law. So he's a religious leader. And then Jesus says to him, what is written in the law? How readest thou? So Jesus is saying, okay, you're an expert on the law. What does the law say about this? And so um, the lawyer, he uh, basically quotes Deuteronomy 6.5 and Leviticus 19.18. And he says in, in verse 27, and he answered and said, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all their strength, and with all their mind, and their neighbor as thyself. And then Jesus basically says, you answered right, go ahead and do that, right? So when we go back to when we were looking at verses 17 through 20, in verse 19, it says that we have the power to tread upon serpents and scorpions. So I have um, a lady that I go to church with, and she was getting ready to go somewhere. She lives here in Arizona, too. And she had her hands full of books, and she went out the door and was getting ready to get in her car, and she tripped over the garden hose. Well, when she tripped over it, she felt something on her leg. And then she realized it wasn't the garden hose that she tripped over. It was the rattlesnake. So that's not a good thing, right? And she realized when she looked at her leg, her leg was bleeding. The snake had actually bit her. And then it was making its way down her driveway. Wow. So because of her relationship with God, she said, Psalm 9113, that she can tread upon the lion and the adder. So she knew that, like, that was something that was in her and it just came out of her, you know, as soon as that happened. So that's relationship, right? That's knowing who your daddy is. And um, so she, you know, went into the house. They ended up going to the hospital because, you know, she's been bit, bit by a rattlesnake. And when she got to the hospital, they did all these tests on her. She was there for about six hours. And they said, we cannot find any venom in your blood. Mm -hmm. Like there is no venom in your blood. Praise God. And, and, and when she left there, they were astonished that there was no venom in her leg. I mean, there was clearly bite marks in her leg. She would clearly been, been bitten. And, you know, folks here in Arizona, we know that when you've been bitten by something, you're supposed to take a picture of it <laughs> and bring it in. So I'm assuming they took a picture of it as well. But they clearly knew that it was a rattlesnake. So that's what Jesus is talking about. The power that she had is because she knew her dad, because she knew what the word said, and it was in her. Um, 
there's other examples too, where, um, you know, Paul and Silas, you know, when they were um, going about spreading the good news and they had that soothsayer that was behind them saying, these men are the men from the most high God. And she was, you know, continually basically bothering them and saying this. And it said it went on, <clears throat> excuse me, it said it went on for days. And so finally, Paul just turns around and says, get out of her. Now, here's, here's what was happening in that scenario. She wanted to affiliate herself with that power. She wanted to be like, hey, I know about this too, right? But that's not how it works. Mm -hmm. And so that's why Paul was able to cast that demon out of her. You know, that, that um, spirit of division was cast out of her. So, you know, back to um, the lawyer coming and asking Jesus these questions. And Jesus basically said, you know, you've answered right. And then when, you, when it comes down, to verse 29, it says, but he willing to justify himself and unto Jesus, who is my neighbor? He's asking Jesus, well, who is my neighbor? Right? So this is when Jesus goes into the parable of the, the good Samaritan. So he's saying, okay, there's a, a certain man that's, that's traveling from Jericho until, or it's from Jerusalem until to Jericho. So the commentaries tell us that it's about 17 miles, 17 to 18 miles um, for them to travel from these two places. And it's very steep. It's very treacherous. And they actually call it something like the bloody trail. Like this is not a good area to be traveling in. So they'll, they'll know about this. So he's, he's talking about this person traveling. So first along comes the priest. And it actually says that the priest sees him. So we know that he sees him and he passes on to the other side and he continues on his way. So this is the man that's been injured that he sees. And, you know, we're assuming that this man that's been injured is a Jewish person. And then along comes a Levi. Now the Levi's were servants to the priest. So these are also holy people. So both these people are considered to be religious leaders and they're supposed to be, you know, considered good people because they're holy people. And so this person, uh, the Levi, sees, the, sees this man that's wounded because robbers have come and they've beaten him and they've left him for half dead. Mm -hmm. So the Levi passes by on the other side and doesn't stop. Then when you get to verse 33, it says, but a certain Samaritan, Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was. And when he saw him, he had compassion on him. I think the key word there is that he had compassion on him. Amen. And, um, you know, so it goes on to say that um, this person takes care of him and, um, you know, he spends two days wages, you know, and brings him to an inn and, and says, look, if there's anything else that needs to be taken care of, just, you know, basically put it on my tab, you know, and then I will, I will make up for it. So he takes care of him. He treats his wounds. He, he pays money for him. And, and the main thing to understand is the relationship between Samaritans and the Jewish people. They hate each other. As a matter of fact, if, if a priest is going to go somewhere and they have to go through Samaria, they will go around it instead of going through Samaria because there is such an animosity towards these groups of people. And um, so, you know, it talks about it a lot in Hosea where the Assyrians had come in and they had taken over the Northern territory. And so they had divided the people. And so you get, what you end up with is you get a little bit of Judaism and you get a little bit of paganism. And so they've mixed those together. And what this group of people have done is they've made their own temple. And they're basically saying that, um, Jesus is comparable to Moses, and that's about all. So there's some discrepancies between these two people, and they do not want to have anything to do with each other. So what's very interesting is it's the most unlikely people that can come along and help in a time of need. And so, you know, he, Jesus asked the lawyer, so then which one would you say is the one that would be the neighbor? And, um, you know, the lawyer says, it's the man that showed mercy on him. And um, what's interesting about that is then Jesus just says, okay, go and do the same. And 
it kind of cuts off after that. So in, in my mind, I, I, it feels kind of like the, um, the person, the, the lawyer is a little disappointed, you know, that he wasn't able to trip Jesus up on that. Yeah. So I have some, um, some quotes I want to read. And um, I don't know if here's a little plug. <laughs> this book is the most amazing book by Andrew, and it's called Self Centeredness, The Source of All Grief. You know, we always say that that's the best leadership book out there. Oh my gosh. I keep it in my purse. I mean, it's just little. And um, so here's a quote this is on page two, and it says, Your perspective would change if you reached beyond yourself and your own crisis to help someone else in a more difficult place. Mm -hmm. Your problems would shrink fast as you pitched in and assisted someone else who's been devastated financially, emotionally, spiritually, or physically. All of a sudden, it would dawn on you. I'm really not as bad off as I thought. So with this whole scenario about the good Samaritan, you know, this is interrupting his day. He's on his way to go do something, you know? And um, so to, to really be others minded, you really do have to take the focus off of yourself. Mm -hmm. And again, the key word for that was that he was moved with compassion. Amen. Here's some other, um, here's another quote. Zig Ziglar said, you can have everything in life that you want if you will just help other people get what they want. Wow. Isn't that awesome? It's powerful. Yeah. And then um, E.W. Jackson, I was listening the other day to him um, when he was on Truth and Liberty. Mm -hmm. He said, if you are determined, nobody can stop you. Help will come from unexpected places. That's good. So this is what happened in this scenario. Help came in an unexpected place. Now, this could take it to the next level. I don't know if you've heard of Oscar Schindler. So Oscar Schindler was a person that during World War II where Hitler was in power and he was actually um, part of the Nazi party. And um, he, was, he was a womanizer. He was an unethical businessman. He was a drunkard. And there was a lot of character flaws in him. But he also saved 1,200 Jewish people. So what he did is he had factories, or maybe just one factory, but he employed all these Jewish people in order to save their lives. So the most unlikely person you know, was able to come in and save all these people. Amen. And um, so when you look at the priest and you look at the, the, the Levi, the priest is really um, an example of um, rituals and customs. And the Levi is a representation of the law. And with those two things, only compassion was what saved the man that was wounded and, and damaged alongside the road. And um, so when, when you ask the question, you know, who is my neighbor? Then really your neighbor is anyone who is in need to whom you have the opportunity to help. Amen. And listening to Greg Moore on Monday during his live stream, he said, you are the change agent. So it's just amazing that um, the most unlikely person could come in and make a change for somebody like this. Amen. When you look at the way the world is working right now, some people um, don't look at um, one per person that's representing the Democratic Party or somebody that's re representing the Republican Party. They look at them as a whole group of people to be despised. But God's solution is, who is your neighbor? Mm -hmm. And he's saying that we're to love our neighbor as yourself. Amen. So when we have opportunity, it's so easy to put stuff on Facebook and say mean things towards those people. But once you're face to face with it, then that makes a big difference. Amen. And the way that the 70 were sent out they were to proclaim the good news and there was a reason and there was an urgency and there was a way that God wanted them to represent themselves. 
So how we represent ourselves today really does matter. Amen. 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 That's awesome, Deanne. Thank you so much for sharing. And what, what I thought was, what I think is really powerful about that is you look at uh, at the start of, um, I mean, the, the, all the nine chapters prior to Luke chapter 10, Jesus is spending time, he's investing into the disciples. So mm -hmm. it's not like he just said, go somewhere. He sent them out from himself. Right. He lived yeah. that life in front of them. He lived that representation. And then he was able to, to multiply himself through those 70. That's powerful. I don't know yeah. if it's, I don't know if it's 70 or 72. We'll just say 71 because that's right. <laughs> well, we'll say just to even it out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's awesome. Well, we have some just great questions. And, um, and so we'll jump right into them. Uh, so Ruthie on chat asks, asks this, how do you balance helping people without being a doormat or bailing them out of every situation? Yeah. Well, I think that's a really good question too. And one of the things that in this story, it wasn't like, um, they agreed with each other, mm -hmm. you know, so you can still hold your standards. Um, we had talked to, when I was talking about uh, the family member that has decided not to, to talk to us and to distance themselves from us, you know, that's their prerogative and they're able to do that. Um, but at the same time, you have to keep in mind that it is not your job to save these people. And so when you receive resistance from that person, there's certain people that you have a place to speak into their lives and there's certain opportunities. And that's what we're talking about, those laborers that come across other people's paths. So if, um, if you feel like somebody is taking advantage of you and not really open to hear what you have to say, which happens a lot. Sure. Carrie Pickett talked about this. Carrie Pickett, you know her, right, Mike? Yeah, I think I've met her <laughs> once or twice. So. Yeah, she had talked about this too, where she wanted to love on this person and she kept loving on him and loving on him and loving on him. It was when they were in Russia. And um, she finally realized that that person wasn't open to receive anything from her. And so what she did is she just distanced herself from that person then. And then she just prayed for that person. And, and, and I hate to say just prayed because prayer is powerful, but that was, um, she, she looked for the opportunity to serve that person. She looked for the opportunity to love that person. But then at one point she felt released from that person and was able to say, okay, God, I'm going to, I'm going to leave the rest of the Holy spirit. Amen. Amen. Cause, Amen. Cause God knows better. There's no yes. about it. So, right. Yeah. So I have a couple of questions that are very similar. So I'm going to go through both of them really quickly. Um, so okay. Bri Brianna on YouTube asked this question, how do you balance loving your neighbor and not offending them when the truth of the word hurts their feelings? And then also um, Ruthie asked this question. Many people, even Christians believe that to love someone, you should accept and tolerate their beliefs. How can you show grace to lo uh, and love without compromising his truth? So how do you not compromise, but how do you also not hurt people's feelings? Yeah. Well, and, and here's, here's the tricky part too, because sometimes God will have you say something and it might offend them, but the truth is the truth. Amen. Um, again, it really has to a lot to do with what type of relationship would you have with that person? Um, there's some people that you're going to slowly build that relationship. Um, we used to live in a different neighborhood and, and um, my son played football with, um, this other mother's, my son played football with her son. And um, so instead of coming in and telling her, hey, do you know Jesus? You know, instead of saying that to her, I sat with her, you know, during the football games. I would sit right next to her. I would ask her questions. I would be interested in her life. You know, so where did you grow up? And, you know, that kind of thing. So sometimes you're supposed to develop a rapport with these people before you're able to even have an open spot to even speak to her. Another thing is how you live your life and the things that you need to stand for. So, um, you know, there were certain things that um, my husband and I would not include ourselves in but we would do it politely and people would start to notice that we didn't include ourselves in those type of things. Mm -hmm. Um, so, so your conduct is really big and, um, developing that relationship is really big. Now, sometimes you don't have that much time, you know, maybe you're just meeting this person in passing. 
And, and there you just really rely on the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit speaks to you and he knows how to get through those filters so that you can say the right words to that person where they will receive it as truth. But don't ever put pressure on yourself to make it happen because that always ends up in disaster. I know that from um, experience <laughs> where I'm like, you have to know Jesus, you have to know Jesus. And they're like, get away from me. <laughs> so really, you know, um, there's different ways that you're going to approach people and you really have to be um, discerning and listening to the Holy Spirit of how you're to approach those Amen. people. I think that's really powerful too, because just like you talked about the aspect of building relationship with God and approaching Him on the, that basis, it's also important to build relationship with people. So it's not only the yeah. vertical, it's the horizontal. It's how do you yeah. share the love of Jesus through your lifestyle and through just not your natural actions and showing your compassion towards them. Right. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. So um, walking with Him on YouTube asks this question, does neighbor represent all people, it's anybody, or does it um, represent somebody in need? I would say it represents all people. You know, um, everybody has needs. Amen. And um, one of the things that, you know, especially reading from Andrew's book, that's something that we've discovered that does work well in our family. Um, if I am struggling with something, then I'm going to seek somebody else out and I'm going to intercede for that person. Amen. You know, that seems to work really well, too, with um, if somebody has pain in their body. You know, it's so hard when you have pain in your body to ignore the pain and believe. But as an intercessor, I can stand in the gap for that person because I'm not necessarily here, you know, feeling the, the physical um, repercussions right. you know, or, or feeling that. Um, so... Um, yeah, I just think that it's it's really the more that you can take the focus off of yourself, because the word says that that God has met all of our needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Amen. If my needs are met, then I'm just going to thank him. So, you know, whatever my circumstances, God, I thank you that you've already brought a solution to that. Amen. And I'm handing it over to you. Amen. So I, I hope that answers the question. I think so. Maybe. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Um, so, uh, so Mandy on chat asked this question, when praying for laborers to cross our loved one's path and minister, should we, we be declaring this over them repeatedly? Is there a specific Bible verse we can stand on regarding our unsaved loved ones? You know, um, the way that I always pray for people, um, you know, there's people that we have in our lives where um, it's been a time and we continue to pray for them. Um, what I like to do is during my quiet time, I like to be quiet before God and say, okay, God, who do I need to be praying for today? Um, I think um, where we get tripped up a little bit is we think that if we, if we really keep doing it over and over, then we'll get God to do something. <laughs> and that's not really how it works, you know? And so, um, when I get quiet before God, I say, okay, God, who is it? Bring to my mind who I need to be praying for. And sometimes he'll even wake me up in the middle of the night and I have somebody's name on my heart. And so then I'll just start praying in the spirit and I'll be start praying for them. Sometimes I don't even know what I'm praying for them, yeah. you know? Um, but as far as doing it over and over, when they come to your mind, when they come to your heart, then yes, go ahead and lift them up. And, you know, I would stand on that scripture. I would stand on, on chapter 10, verse two, where, okay, God, please, you know, I'm praying that laborers would come across their path. Amen. And I always add things to it, help them to hear your voice clearly, God, so that they know exactly what to say that would bring revelation to that person. Like God knows the number of hairs upon our head. He knows our thoughts. He knows every single thing about us. And so he knows what to tell you to say in order to get through to this person's heart. And he's not going to trespass anybody's will, but he knows how our brains work. Amen. He's that good. Amen. Absolutely. So Ruthie on chat asks this. She said in Mark 12, 31, says uh, to love your neighbor as yourself. What if you really don't love or even like yourself? How could you love others? Um, would you need to have a personal revelation before you could fully invest in other people's lives? Well, I would tell Ruthie to get this book. <laughs> Because Andrew actually talks about that. Um, one of the things that Andrew talked about um, is when he thought about all the bad things that he was doing all the time, that it really it was putting his focus on himself. And so even if we have self-loathing, it's about self. Yeah. And so really 
we do love ourselves because we're going to protect ourselves. Um, you know, even people that are shy, you know, they say, well, I'm just shy. Well, they're really protecting themselves because they're afraid that somebody might make fun of them or think they're dumb for saying something, you know, so it really does come down to that. Um, you are a child of God. And because you're a child of God, you're loved. Amen. You're adored. Amen. And, 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 and so just knowing that, knowing that, not, not to get too far out there, God died, not just Jesus, but God died because Jesus is God. You know what I mean? He, he, he removed himself from his throne and he stepped down and he took on all this junk, mm -hmm. all this stuff because he loves you. Amen. And so if God loves you and he doesn't make junk, then you should love you. Amen. That's good. That's really good. And I'll tell you, um, for those of you who are interested in that book, it's self -centered. again, it's self-centered and it's the source of all grief. It's a phenomenal book. If you could just go to awmi.net, you'll be able to find that <laughs> in other materials as well. So, uh, so um, Mandy on chat asked this question. I have a family member who has been curious about Christianity, but keeps going back to new age uh, and those pagan beliefs. Uh, she is open one day and closed the next day. Uh, how should I be praying for her to receive Christ? Should I be telling her that I am praying for her, even though it seems to upset her? Yeah. Okay. Here, here's the thing. We never know where people are at. Just because they have a certain reaction doesn't mean that God isn't working on their heart. Yeah. I heard a pastor say one time, if you throw a rock into a pack of dogs, the one that yells the loudest or yelps the loudest is the one that you hit. That's right. So that's kind of what I was talking about before. Sometimes when you say something to somebody, they're going to come back at you because they're being convicted in their heart. And they, they don't want to know it, but they do want to know it. Um, again, you really need to rely on the Holy Spirit because I think a lot of times we say more than what we're supposed to say. Amen. You know, we really do have to trust that the Holy Spirit knows exactly what he's doing. The Holy Spirit is good at their job and, and not to discount prayer. Prayer really does work. And, and then we can stand on the word knowing that God loves them more than you do, Amen. which sometimes seems impossible to us. Amen. So yeah, I would just really encourage you to really press in and ask God when you're supposed to say something and when you're not supposed to say something and really try to stay away from Christianese. You know, God gives us parables and he gives us something that we can relate to and, and he'll do that for you as well so that you can explain it better to people that might not understand some of these words. Amen. That's really good. Uh, so we have time for one more question. Okay. And so, um, in, uh, in the first part of Luke chapter 10, it talks about how Jesus sent them out two by twos. And so this question comes and it says, I am, a sing I am single and I'm, I feel like God is calling me to the mission field. Uh, should mm -hmm. I wait for a spouse before I go? I have no idea. <laughs> I think that if you're supposed to wait for a spouse, God would tell you. You know, um, Barry Bennett talks about this. He's one of the teachers at Karis. And he talks about, he knew he was supposed to go to Mexico mm -hmm. and he knew he was supposed to go be a missionary there. And so he packed up his stuff and he went to Mexico and then he came home with his tail between his legs because he was like, it wasn't time. So if you're going to be on the mission field, then you, you need to make sure that you're discerning the voice of God. Amen. Now, I know that Carrie went on the mission field without a husband. Um, they sent these people out, you know, God or Jesus sent them out with two people for a purpose. Um, it was going to be a dangerous road. Yeah. You know, there, there's a purpose where there was some protection in that as well. So a lot of that has to play into it. It doesn't mean that you have to go out as, you know, two people. But in this scenario, he was basically saying, look, travel light. It could be dangerous, but I'm going to protect you. Amen. So I would not... Um, I would not just pigeonhole um, what you're supposed to do just based on this one scripture, because you're supposed to be at two or three, right? And then have God speak to you that way. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. No, I think that's really good because sometimes we can take a concept, we can make a whole philosophy out of it. When, uh, mm -hmm. like you said, there are, there are certain 
there are certain aspects that cause Jesus to send his, his disciples out that way. I think it mm -hmm. is good to have two people going, but if God has spoken to your heart, again, it goes back to that r relationship that you have with him, that you're following after that relationship and really pursuing it. Yeah, and I think you have to be careful that you're not doing it because Carrie did it or because somebody else did it. You do what you're supposed to do. Amen. Um, whatever God's speaking to your heart, and he's going to make it clear because he's not trying to trick you. Amen. He'll make it very clear. That's right. Well, Deanne, thank you so much for sharing with us today. It's been just a phenomenal time. I know I've been really blessed and I'm sure all of our viewers have as well. So thank you for joining us all the way from Arizona. I know it's, uh, it's starting to get a little bit late there. So just want to say again, thank you so much and, and, uh, and you're such a blessing. And to all those uh, who joined us tonight, um, thank you. Thank you as well. I believe this has been a blessing to you. We want to invite you to just join us again. Again, these are care, these are daily live Bible studies. So we're going to be having another one tomorrow. That's Friday at 10 a.m. Mountain Standard Time. So just so you're aware, we have this, our schedule is we have this every Monday and, and Friday at 10 a.m. That's the, These are all Mountain Time. Tuesdays and Thursdays at 6, at, at 6 p.m. and then also Wednesdays at 7 a.m. So once again, thank you so much. We speak a blessing over you for the rest of your day or your evening, depending on where you are in the world. And we look forward to seeing you again very soon.